Okay. All right. Um, welcome everybody to our photography class, uh, our fourth class. And uh, I hope you had a good week last week. And um, I saw many of your submissions uh, of your photos on Google Classroom. And uh, it seems that most of you understood uh, about exposure and overexposure and underexposure. So I'm glad uh, it was not as confusing as I thought it may have been, but I'm glad you all understood. Um, this week's class is going to be on something a little easier, so let's uh, get into it. Uh, small revision from last week. Few of you had some uh, doubt about uh, aperture, so just a small recap, and then we'll continue. So <clears throat> keep in mind that the bigger the aperture or the size that your lens allows the light in through, the more shallow your depth of field will be. Okay, you'll have more blur. And the smaller the hole or smaller the aperture, then less blur in the background. Okay, these things are basically the openings of the lens. You can see the gaps here. These are what they represent. So the smaller the aperture, the smaller the, the lesser the blur behind. And bigger the aperture, the more blur behind, okay? More shallow depth of field, okay? More blur. All right. Uh, we will come back uh, for more details, more advanced details a little later. But for now, that's uh, what aperture does. All right. Resolution. We've all heard of uh, this camera having 24 megapixels or that camera having 50 megapixels. And some, some phones are even coming out with 108 megapixels. And what are megapixels? Well, megapixels are uh, basically a count of how many pixels the camera sensor has. It can vary from sensor to sensor. So some cameras may have 12 megapixels and some camera may have 16, 24, it, it, it can vary. And uh, megapixel uh, basically means uh, a million pixels. It's not exactly a million, but we round it off as a million pixels. So one megapixel is equal to a mil one million pixels. All right. You can see here on the left side, uh, small, 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 small dots. All of these are pixels. These pixels, they are the ones that um, record the light that is falling on them on the sensor. All right. Now here you can see a box uh, a small rectangle that's divided into two. Okay, uh, these are going to be my illustrations for you to understand what um, pixels are and what they do. <clears throat> okay, so imagine you have a camera that has only two pixels. All right, only two pixels, and then you point the camera at something and you take a picture. You will most likely get a blank picture, something like this. All right, only no color, no nothing, uh, just blank. Now, if you had a camera that was with four pixels divided like this, and then you pointed at something and then you took a picture, then you would have more variety in what you're seeing. Sounds a little confusing, but let's go a little further. And uh, the more pixels you have, more sharper images, all right. So let's say now you have a sensor with 16 pixels, all right? And then you point at something, Okay, let's just say that something is a mountain. So you point at a mountain and you take a picture. Then now that you have more pixels, you have more room to see details, right? Compared to the previous slide where you had less pixels to see details in. Now you're able to start to see more details because you have more pixels here, all right? And then let's say you have even more pixels. All right, so now we had a four by four grid. Now we have 18 by eight, eight by eight, and now it's 64 pixels. Now we're starting to see the shape of the mountain. All right, and, and so as, as we go more and more and more, eventually we end up with a huge sensor that has so many pixels, millions of pixels, uh, and then you're able to see the mountain clearly. All right, if you had very less pixels, then it would be like this. And if you have enough pixels, you'll get a clear picture like this. Of course, now this grid that I drew over here is just for you to understand. The picture has actually way more pixels than this grid can show. All right. So by having more pixels, you're able to show more detail. You're able to see the trees and the leaves and 
your clouds and the skies and everything. Each pixel will record information uh, of the light that is falling on it. Okay. So the more pixels that are there, uh, the clearer your picture will be. Now, when you have a picture on your phone or on your computer and you zoom in quite a lot, then you will start to see something that looks like this. All right. When you look at it from afar, when you zoom out, the picture looks very crisp and clear. But when you zoom in, you will start to see that uh, there are many boxes. These are your pixels. All right. So um, if you zoom in to just this eye area over here, you're able to see all these boxes here. Now, I want you to pick um, any particular box. All right. And you will notice, let's say you're taking this box over here. Now, this box has one value, all right? Within this box, you will not see any change from any corner to corner or, or in the middle or on the sides anywhere. Within this box, it's just one value. And that applies for all of these. So whichever box you may have picked, you will notice that the whole box is filled with just that color. And that is how pixels work. So each pixel will record just one value and that is what it will hold. And in order to get more detail, you need to have more pixels. So that's how you get a gradient. For example, if you see here, the beak on top is bright and down is dark. So in order to get that effect from bright to dark, it has to go through many pixels that record different light values. And eventually it goes from light to dark. Same with any other color that the bird has, any eyes or anywhere. So the more pixels you have, the more room that is there uh, for the camera to record uh, details. All right. Now, if it's like that, then why do we only stop with 24 megapixels or 50 megapixels? Why not have someone invent a 150 megapixel camera or 300 pixel megapixel camera? And why not just increase the pixels? Well, there are pros and cons to having more pixels as well. When you have more pixels, uh, yes, you'll have sharper images. And since you have more pixels, you can zoom in more without having to worry about losing details. But when you do that, uh, when you're trying to cram so many pixels within that small sensor, then that means that there's less light, uh, res less area for light to fall on for that sensor to record. And uh, by doing that, your camera will do uh, not as great when it's darker or stuff like that. All right, so when you have smaller pixels, the the pixels have less light to work with. Each individual pixel has less light to work with. And uh, when you have more megapixels, then that means that the camera has to store more data in each picture. And each photo that you click will be very big picture. That's why when you notice some phones, they click 12 megapixel photos and they have like, let's say they're 3 MB or 4 MB. And then some phones will click 100 megapixel photo and then they'll be like, 20 MB and 30 MB and they're very big, big file sizes. So storing them becomes an, a problem. Now with less megapixels, yes, it may not be as sharp as the pictures that are taken with more megapixel and you have less room to work with. You cannot zoom in too much and you cannot crop too much. You cannot edit uh, by cutting off the size or anything like that. But uh, since you have the less number of megapixels, you're able to have uh, larger pixels within that same size of sensor. All right. So by having larger pixels in that same size sensor, you're able to allow more light to fall on these pixels. That is why you will notice that some professional cameras these days, they don't really uh, bump up the number of uh, megapixels that they have. Yes, some cameras are out there with 50 or 45 or 75 megapixels, 75 million pixels. But there are some cameras that are professional level that cost almost 3,000 to 4,000 US dollars. And they only come with 12 megapixel uh, sensors. Why is that? That's mainly because they want to focus on getting enough light on that pixel so that it can do very well at night or low light or uh, like that. So it depends on your use case scenario on which camera you pick. So more megapixels are not always better. Uh, so please keep that in mind as well. All right, we talked about uh, the resolution. 
and about how it affects the sharpness and clarity of an image. Another thing that affects the sharpness and clarity of your image is having a good lens. Now, there are many lenses and we studied about that a little bit earlier. Uh, today, we'll go into a li little more detail. And uh, if you have a camera with you, then you can keep that with you. Phones are also fine. We'll be studying about the phones right after we learn about the camera lenses. So if you were to take an old lens and new, new lens, <clears throat> you're just gonna get better results from the new lens. It's because they're using modern technology and they're able to uh, eliminate any problems that the old lenses would have had. Yes, some people still choose to use older lenses because it has a it has a look to it or it has a vintage or an old feel that they like, and th that's fine too. But uh, when you come to when it comes to clarity, modern lenses offer better uh, sharpness in the pictures compared to older lenses. There are two main categories of lenses. Um, they are called prime lenses and zoom lenses. Now, prime lenses are uh, not prime lenses. I mean, lenses are categorized based on focal lengths. All right. Now, uh, remember I just said that we have prime lenses and zoom lenses. We will touch on this within a few slides. So keeping that aside, I want you to remember this part. Now, lenses are categorized based on focal lengths. Now, you would have seen some pictures of some professionals where they have a bag and when you open the bag, there's like three different lenses or five different lenses. So each of these lenses have different, uh, they do different things, all right? Using the same camera, you can get different results by changing the lenses. So the three different types of lenses are wide, telephoto and macro. Now, this categorization is based on what they do. All right, what they do to the light that is entering the camera. And the most common focal lengths are these numbers here. And I put them uh, numerically so that you'll understand. Um, on the left side, you can see a smaller number, number 14. And on the right side, you'll see number 200. Now, the smaller the number here, the wider the picture will be. All right, and the bigger the number, like let's say 135 or 200, then that means you're zooming in more, all right? So to be wide, then you will take a smaller number, smaller focal length or a wider focal length and to zoom in or like to zoom to a distance, then you will take a bigger focal length. So 105 or 135 or 200. There are even lenses that go 400 or 600 and sometimes uh, 800, those are all lenses that they use for different kinds of photography, such as uh, wildlife photography, where they cannot get too close to the animals and stuff like that. Uh, here is a small uh, breakdown of how the lenses are usually used for. Uh, this is uh, the general use case scenario, all right? This is not strictly how they must be used for, but this is how they are generally used for. Um, when photography is involved, you can use any lens for any kind of photography. It's up to you to experiment your style and everything. It's personal. It, it's on how you want to convey uh, a picture. But this is how it is generally used for. So when you have a wide view, uh, start like let's say you have a uh, wide lens. So like I said, smaller number, wider lens, all right, wider view. So since you have a wide view, you're able to show a lot more of what is around. So these kind of lenses are generally used for architecture to show buildings big or like when you want to show the inside of a room and want to make it look spacious and things like that, then you want to use a wide lens So and landscape. So you can show the whole area, you can show the mountains or the valleys and everything. You want to show more. In that case, you will use a wide lens. And then uh, if there is wide, there's also uh, zoom and in between is normal. What do I mean by normal is uh, how our eyes see everything. Now, our human eyes see everything at an equivalent of a 50 mm lens. All right. So the way we see perspective, um, that is if you want to get the exact same view, then you can use a 50 mm lens. And then there are the telephoto lenses. These lenses are the lenses that we use to zoom in into things. 
So now let's say there's something that's at a little distance away from you and you want to zoom in to show emphasis on that. Then you will use a telephoto lens. And then there are the telephoto lenses that go really far and they zoom in even further and uh, they will allow you to get pictures of things that are far away. And uh, keep in mind that these lenses are doing something called optical zoom. Now, uh, when you zoom, there's again two kinds, digital zoom and optical zoom. Optical zoom is when the lenses bend the light that is coming inside. They manipulate the light that is coming in through the lens so that uh, your camera gets to get, get the light from the subject of what you're taking photo of uh, without having to compromise on your quality all that much. All right. But digital zoom is when your camera, it takes a picture with using the sensor and then it artificially zooms in. So by doing that, you will have a reduced uh, quality image. Um, it is similar to taking a picture on your phone and then zooming in a lot. And you will see that as you zoom in further and further, the quality of the picture decreases. That's because that's a digital zoom. All right. But these lenses are physically moving the uh, components inside and allowing the light to come in a different way. And that's how they zoom in and they get good quality pictures uh, by optically zooming in, all right? Optical zoom versus digital zoom. Now use case scenarios again, um, there are multiple uses for any lenses, but uh, generally this is how it is for, like I mentioned, wide angle lenses are used for architecture or landscape. And then normal, uh, lenses like how we see between 35 to 70 is used for street photography, documentaries, or portraits. And then uh, lenses that go between 70 to 70 and above are basically telephoto lenses, uh, zoom lenses that go and show you a close up of something that's uh, even f farther away. And this side of the spectrum, when you see like 300 or above, these are the lenses that professionals use to get pictures of birds or animals that are far, far away uh, without scaring them off or going too close to them. All right, here's another uh, look at the same subject, uh, the same thing that we're trying to photograph, but using di different lenses. So you can see at 28 mm, uh, which is a smaller number, uh, you're able to see a lot more around. You're able to see the buildings nearby. You're able to see this plant over here, this tree on the left side. You're able to see a lot more. And then when you come to a 50 mm, uh, this is what our human eyes usually see, our human eye perspective. And we're able to see the line is a little closer up. We're able to see around as well. And at 100 mm, you're zooming in even more now. Uh, over here, you couldn't see the text all that much, but here you're starting to see the text on the top you're able to see more of the details on the lion's face. You're able to see some lines and some dots and all those things there. And when you zoom in to 200 mm, then you're able to see even more details, more close up, uh, all these dots over here from corrosion and all those details you're able to see. So as I said, human eyes see things at a focal length of 50 mm or around 50 mm. And 35 mm or lower are called wide angle lenses and 70 mm and above are uh, zoom or telephoto lenses. Wide angle lenses, uh, here's, a photo of, here's a photo taken from a wide angle lens. Uh, as you can see, you're able to see all that's around this building as well. You're able to see the road, the vehicles and all those things. And uh, like this, they, people use these lenses to take landscapes and architecture. And something that uh, this lens does in photos is it adds something called uh, distortion. So this distortion is basically when the picture seems to bend in a weird way. Uh, you can see here that, of course, these buildings were all built straight and you know that, but uh, because of the way that the lens bends the light to show more of the area, the buildings look like they've curved in. Um, and that's not just for the buildings, even if you point that at any other subject, because of the lens, everything else will seem to bend around. Look at the floor over here, you can see that even though this footpath is supposed to be straight, because of how the lens is, it gives this effect 
um, it distorts the light and it makes it look like it's curved over here. On the opposite side, we have telephoto lenses. These are the lenses that you use to really take pictures of things that are far away and zoomed in. These allow you to get more details of, uh, of things and th it allows you to go closer to that subject uh, without having to move yourself physically. They use these lenses at weddings, for example, if you're in a church and uh, they don't want the photographer to walk around too much sometimes, then the photographer will have to switch to a telephoto lens and from far away, you'll have to zoom in and try to get the pictures as close as possible. Uh, they also use this in portraits and in wildlife and other things. The third lens is uh, macro lens. Uh, there's, there's wide, telephoto, and macro. These lenses are not very common. Uh, they're specialized and they're usually only used by professionals for specific tasks like uh, close up of very small subjects. So if you've seen pictures of insects like these, uh, sometimes you may have seen pictures of the fibers of cloth. Um, you may have seen pictures of um, some things that look very small, like uh, leaves or things that are zoomed in so close like this. They're all taken using macro lenses or lenses that have been adapted to function like a macro lens. But these are a very niche category. And most people usually uh, go with a wide and telephoto lens, not with macro lens so much, unless they want to specifically get this look. Now, remember I mentioned before primes and zoom lenses, the main two categories. Well, now all these lenses that I mentioned before uh, can fall in this in, in one of these categories. All right, so prime lenses are the lenses that allow the users to have only one focal length. So let's say I have a, a lens that is only uh, 200 mm, like as very zoomed in. Then uh, if I attach that to my camera, even if I want to uh, take a group picture or if I want to take a picture of something that's big, then, then I will not be able to zoom out unless I myself move back and go very far away to allow my lens, my camera to see the whole thing. Uh, that is a prime lens. Or let's say I have a prime lens that is uh, only 14 mm. Okay, that's very wide. Now, 14 mm lenses or 18 mm lenses are wide. And uh, if I want to take a picture of something that's far away, then I cannot use this lens because that object would be very far and very small. So then I have to walk, go close to it, and then take a picture of it. Zoom lenses, on the other hand, are the lenses that allow you to have uh, multiple focal lengths, all right? So you're able to uh, stay where you are, but allow, uh, by twisting your lens, you can, you can either get a little wider look or you can have a more zoomed in, more telephoto look. So both lenses have their advantages. So, when you have a prime lens, since you're not uh, since you're not having to adjust the inside of the lens uh, for zooming in, it allows that the companies to make the lens so that they have very large apertures sometimes. So prime lenses go up to like f 1.8, which is already big, and then f 1.4, which is even bigger. Uh, aperture and then finally you have lenses that go f 1.2 or f1 uh, all these are very very large apertures and you get this blur behind the person and it's very buttery and creamy and it looks wonderful and professional so those uh, prime lenses are very uh, very nice to work with and they are very sharp because they have less moving elements on the inside of the lens so they're very sharp and you get very clean pictures but the problem with prime lenses is since you can't zoom in so much, you'll have to carry a different lens for each focal length. So let's say I'm shooting at a wedding and I have only prime lenses. Then I need to take a separate lens for taking group pictures since it's wide and there are many people. Then I need to take a separate lens for taking zoomed in pictures in case I need to stand far and take a close up of the couple or the, or the pastor or someone of the, some pictures of the guest. Then I need to have a different lens. Then I have to carry multiple lenses. Zoom lenses eliminates this problem 
by offering a lens that can change focal length. So when you're uh, moving from one focal length to another focal length, you're zooming in. Basically, you're going closer without moving yourself. Standing where you are, you're able to get a closer picture. So since these lenses are modern in our present time, they are still very sharp. And most people may not notice the difference until you, unless you like very carefully look at it on a computer, you zoom in, zoom in, zoom in and look. Uh, and they still offer very good pictures and many professionals use zoom lenses as well. Uh, but these lenses, since they are having more moving parts inside compared to prime lenses, they do not have as big an aperture as prime lenses would allow them to. Um, and they go up to f2.8 and some lenses I've seen go up to 2.4. And recently, uh, professionals are getting lenses that go up to f2. And that is seen as a big uh, accomplishment in, in itself because zoom lenses going to such a large aperture um, is difficult, but with modern technology, they're, they're able to do that. And these lenses are larger than prime lenses usually and a little heavier as well. But the benefit is that you don't have to, call, you don't have to carry multiple lenses. With just one lens, you're able to uh, cover multiple focal, focal ranges. Uh, focal lengths and you're able to get wide and you're able to get zoomed in with just one lens. <clears throat> All right. Now, phones and lenses. Uh, before we start this, I just want to ask quickly if anyone has any doubts about camera lenses. And if they do, then I'll answer that and then we'll go into phones and lenses. Does anyone have a doubt? If you do, then you can turn your video on and you can raise your hand or you can just raise your hand using this emoji over here. Um, if you have a doubt, do let me know now. Okay. If you don't have a doubt, do let me know now. You can give any kind of reaction. You can unmute yourself or raise your hand. Uh, if you don't have a doubt, then please let me know or I will wait till you give me a response. Just wanted to ask uh, the, the lenses which they use for the football games, okay. those big ones, those are telephoto? Yes. yes, those are all telephoto lenses. Okay. Because sometimes when the players are very far away, they're not able to go on the field and take close-up pictures, right? So they have to use telephoto lenses to zoom in from the outside of the football arena. And then they're able to zoom in and get close up of the pictures of the players or the football or whatever they're photographing. Can't they use uh, macro lenses instead of telephoto? All right. Macro lenses uh, can be used, uh, but with how they use, uh, how they have special lenses for different things. Macro lenses are used to take close up of objects. So let's say you have, um, you have, let's say, what, what do you have? Let's say you have a textbook and you want to take a close up of the words. Then you can use the lenses to get, uh, get the camera close to the, to the text and you can take a close up. Or an insect. Um, you may have seen pictures of those insects and their eyes. You can see each of, like, some, some insects have multiple eyes and you're able to see. Uh, very close up details of all those things. All those yeah. are taken with macro lenses, but these lenses do not allow you to take pictures that are very far away, okay. like how telephoto lenses allow you to do so. Just for quick example, uh, I hope you're not, you're not all squeam. Okay, wait, <laughs> some of you may be squeamish. So I'll just switch to uh, flowers. So you may have seen uh, some close-up pictures, something similar to this, where you can see that uh, normally how if you take a different lens or your phone and you try to get this close, you will not be able to focus because it's too close to the camera and you'll have to move a little back. But macro lenses allow you to go uh, very close and get those details using uh, your camera. But uh, if you were to use a macro lens on a football, football pitch to get pictures of players. You can still get decent pictures like from far away, but you will not be able to zoom in 
like how you would with a telephoto lens. All right. Just another doubt. Sorry. Yes. So the macro lens, it is more than two hundred pixels or less. All right. So pixels again, I would remind is for the sensor in your camera. All right. So whether you have one lens or the other, that doesn't change how many pixels the camera body itself has. The lenses uh, rather would uh, be measured in focal lengths, like I mentioned before. Uh, these focal lengths, uh, yes, 200 mm, I believe is what you meant to say. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, that's OK. So uh, yes, macro lenses uh, are not fixed at a particular focal length, like how we have wide and telephoto. They can they can range uh, from from different focal lengths, but the most common macro lenses that I know of are usually around uh, eighty five to one hundred and thirty five. So some lenses are like one hundred and five mm or one hundred and thirty five mm. So they they're in that range usually. So they're not too telephoto like two hundred and above or anything like that but they are also not as wide as um, other wide angle lenses. Okay, thanks. Okay, anybody else has anything to ask? You can feel free now. And if you don't. I cannot see you face to face. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry I... about that. I, my, my phone's battery is very low, so I couldn't turn my camera on today. Uh, I see. I will make sure to. So I thought something yeah. wrong with me. That's why I wanted to know. <laughs> no, no, it's it's my it's my phone. And okay. I I, uh, I I yes I came late, so I missed everything. Half an right. hour. That, that's okay. We are recording the video, so you okay. can have a look at it when you have some time this week. Okay. All right. So now phones and lenses on your phones. Um, I'm sure if any of you have looked at the phone market uh, recently, you would have seen many of those companies advertising, uh, oh, this phone has two cameras or three cameras or four cameras. Some even have five cameras. Now, why do they have all these cameras? Well, um, as you may have guessed, we cannot remove the lens of our phone and replace them. Uh, not, as in, we cannot do that without causing damage to the phone. Um, we cannot replace them like how we would be able to with a different camera, like a DSLR camera, um, to get different focal lengths or different results that we want. So what these phone man manufacturers do are that they, um, what they do is they have different cameras with fixed focal length lenses attached to them. So for example, um, if you have an iPhone 11, then you will notice that your camera offers two modes when you open the camera. There will be a normal mode or a 1x, and then there's a wide angle mode or a 0.5x, or like it zooms, it zooms out, so you have like a wider view, a wide angle lens. Um, and if you have a Pro, iPhone 11 Pro, I believe, has a telephoto lens as well, you can zoom in a little bit. And same with Androids also, uh, Samsungs and Huawei's and uh, Xiaomi's, all of these companies offer different different cameras. There's no fixed thing, but the most common ones that you find are the normal lens and the wide-angle lens, and then followed by the zoom lens. Uh, sometimes, though, they like to prioritize one over the other. So you will find some cameras having the main camera, the normal camera, will be uh, very good but the wide angle and the zoom camera may have slightly less picture quality. That's because they are not using one camera with different lenses, but they're having separate cameras for each lens. And uh, they all uh, produce different results because they have different lenses. Now some cameras, some phones have uh, cameras that are like two megapixels or sometimes there'll be a depth sensing camera or a black and white camera. Those cameras uh, don't do much in terms of uh, focal length or adding anything. They have other uses, but you can't really access those uses. Uh, the, cam the phone decides what to do with them and stuff like that. So the main, main lenses that you find on phones nowadays are the normal camera, 
the wide angle camera and the zoom camera. And this is essentially providing you with the option to go normal or wide or telephoto, which, which is zoomed in. All right, now um, a small um, diversion, okay? Now we studied about uh, lenses and now we will be studying about another topic called the rule of thirds. Now, as with any other subject, there are rules in photography. These rules can help the photo to look better. It can help the photographer when you are trying to get the picture to look appealing and look nice. And uh, it'll, it'll help uh, the photographer to show the subject in a way that uh, will draw the, the viewer's attention. So you may have noticed that some phones or some cameras uh, have this grid that comes across the screen. Uh, I would encourage you to take your phone right now or your iPad or whatever ca camera that you have and to go into the settings and to enable the grid. Usually if you open a camera app at the top right or the top left corner, you'll have a settings option. Click on that and if you scroll, you'll be able to find uh, a grid option. It should say either three by three or four by four or sometimes uh, it can offer more options also or less options. But for sure, you will find uh, at least the rule of, you at least find this grid uh, three by three. You will find this uh, grid. And if you can, I would highly encourage you to turn it on now so that uh, in the future when you're taking pictures, it will help you. I will give you all a minute or two to do so. And then after that, I will explain more on what this grid does. I will also get my phone and then I will explain by demonstrating. All right, um, apologies, I think I was muted, my bad. Uh, thank you for, for that uh, message. You would have seen on my phone that uh, I had a grid and that by enabling that setting, I was able to get those lines on my screen. Uh, what that does is it enables you as a photographer to control where the people look. Now, whenever you see something or you see a picture, your eyes automatically go a certain way. So by studying that, photographers have been able to make this rule so that uh, by taking a picture of something in a certain way, you're able to have the people look there right away. Uh, by saying this, you may not understand, so I'll demonstrate. Now, uh, the rule of thirds can work in many ways. Now, since you have a grid, you're able to see where the center of your camera is or where the sensor, center of the picture is. So you're able to, if you have a subject that you want to take a picture of, like a flower or something like that, then you're able to keep it right in the center. If you do not have these grid lines, then you may be slightly off center to the side somewhere. And because you have these lines, you're able to frame it in the center. The rule of thirds also allows you to occupy uh, the main subject to be in the left corner, left side over here. Now, uh, you're not limited to the center or the left side. You can be right side, top side, down side, uh, any way. But uh, as long as you follow these measurements, then you will be able to get the viewer to look where you want them to look. For example, now it's on the left side here. Then that means on the right side, it's a little empty, okay? Um, I'll demonstrate with an example again, just after this. And let's say you're taking a picture of something else and then you want it to occupy the bottom part, you can have it go across the bottom three boxes of the grid. What do I mean by occupy these boxes? Um, I'll come to this later. Uh, have a look at this picture here. <clears throat> you can see that uh, this photographer has intentionally left this bottom right area empty. But even then, this picture is very appealing. And why is that? as because he has followed the rule of thirds. Now, 
uh, the rule of thirds is not just about occupying those boxes, but it's also about using these lines. Now you would have seen here uh, this slide. Uh, this slide demonstrates that you can use these lines to place your subject uh, anywhere along these lines. Now you can have them occupy the boxes like I showed previously, or you can have them along these lines. But uh, the most common uh, use for the rule of thirds is at these four points uh, where these lines intersect. <clears throat> that is where uh, the viewer's eyes automatically usually go to. So when you have a photo like this, and then you would have the subject usually placed along this intersection of lines. Now, uh, if you look at any picture, you will notice that not all pictures are like, like this. This is one of the rules. This is not the only rule. So not all picture has to be this way, but uh, you will find a lot of pictures that follow this rule and you'll be able to understand why they did so later. So the rule is it has like using this grid over here, you can tell what is center and you can place a subject in the center or along the center or along the lines or using these boxes, you can have your subject in those boxes as well. Now I will show a few more examples. Now this bird over here, uh, when taking pictures of birds and animals and humans also, uh, we try to keep the eye of the person in emphasis. So here we can see the bird's eye is at the intersection of the lines. The body is along this line and so is the stick over here. And the beak is along this, this line over here. All right, so this photographer by using this uh, grid over here is able to place the bird exactly at that uh, at that place uh, in this photo over here to get the viewer to look there. It also helps that this bird is looking towards the inside and it is not looking towards the outside of the picture. So keep that in mind as well. Uh, this is one example of the rule of thirds. Here is another example. Uh, the cat over here is placed at this bottom right intersection. So by doing so, there's empty space on the top left, but that is intentional. Uh, they didn't accidentally leave that space, that is intentionally left. So that when you first look at the picture, the first thing that you will look at is this cat over here. This picture over here, uh, something that I took <laughs> during quarantine, but if you notice, uh, you will see that this picture was also taken using the rule of thirds. Uh, if you draw a grid across this, you will see that this person's head over here is on the intersection, his body is along the lines. So when I mentioned that uh, it can be in the bottom part or that left part or the center part, all of those can be applied separately for different pictures, all right? Doesn't mean that everything has to be applied in one picture only. So in this picture, I chose to have my point of interest or the subject at this intersection. It can differ from picture to picture and depends on which point of intersection that you want your subject or main interest to be. I will show a few more examples. Now look at this picture over here. This picture over here is very nice and I like it because the photographer used the rule of third twice over here. If you were to draw a grid from, like I mentioned before, the three by three grid, then the photographer uh, has placed this a pattern on the top left uh, intersection and this cup on the bottom right intersection. I want you to imagine a grid over this and then you can see clearly how he has placed that on the intersection and the cup also on this intersection over here. Look at this puppy over here, very cute, right? Well, if you draw the lines, the grid lines, yes, this also follows the rule of thirds you can see that the eye would be exactly where the intersection, the top right intersection would be. And this puppy's body is along the line that comes on the right side. This picture over here also follows the rule of thirds. You can see that the photographer has uh, the hummingbird, the main subject on this intersection over here. It doesn't have to be specifically the eye, it can be the head or the body of a subject. Here he's chosen to have the head at that intersection there. And this side also, uh, though not completely, 
the photographer has uh, this plant on the left side of the picture, not along the line, but within these boxes. Well, so that is going to be your homework for this week. I want you to take your phone or your camera and enable this grid on your camera and on your phone or your camera. And I want you to take two pictures or take as many pictures as you want, but submit two pictures uh, by following this rule of thirds. All right. Uh, you can ask any doubts that you have about this rule of thirds and it will help you not just now, but any anytime you're taking the picture. Uh, so if, if you feel like you have any doubts about it, please feel free to ask. That's going to be your assignment for this week. It will be live on Google Classroom by 9.30. Uh, or right now it's 9 for me. So in half an hour, you'll be able to see the assignment. So I want you to submit two pictures observing the rule of thirds uh, for this week's assignment. It can be on any intersection that you wish to have it, or it can be on the bottom bottom segment or top segment right or left or in the center center is the most common usually so let's try to avoid center because we know it's very common and let's try to have you place your subject which you're taking picture of along the lines or at those points of intersection all right i will at this point stop my screen share and I will be asking you to turn your cameras on wherever possible. Please turn your cameras on. And I will ask if you have any doubts to ask them now.